We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good uh, morning, good afternoon. I hope that you can hear me. Okay, I can see nodding some heads. So thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the next uh, IGF panel. In this panel, we'll be discussing the, about the taxation of the digital economy, or the current challenges of a solution that uh, we have already been discussing for several years. Also during IGF, we hosted similar panels a year ago, two years ago, because as very well many of you know, this is not the new topic. However, there are some new developments from the last several months. So it's uh, definitely very interesting to hear about them and to hear opinion of some experts, perhaps get some questions from the audience. But first of all, let me introduce our today's panelists. Uh, Łukasz Kuśpiesz, chief expert from the Ministry of Finance from the Republic of Poland. Uh, Petra Wikström Schipstedt, Director of Public Policy, and Agnieszka Wnuk, MDDP Group uh, Partner, Tax Advisor. Uh, welcome and thank you very much that you agreed to be here with us today. Maybe before we start, before we go to your opinions, questions, comments, uh, let me just make a quick introduction, overview of the current situation. Uh, also for people who are listening to our panel today so that we are all more or less on the same page and we all understand the subject similarly. Uh, as we very well know, after some years of intensive work and negotiations to bring the international tax rules uh, more into the 21st century, members of the OECD G20 uh, group uh, agreed uh, not long ago, because just two months on 8th of October, to the statement of the two pillar solution to address the tax challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy. 137 countries and jurisdictions in total, representing more than 20% of global GDP, have joined the two pillar solution establishing a new framework for international tax and agreed a detailed implementation plan that envisages implementation of the new rules by 2023. So we are talking about very near future, just the next two years. And the deal will reallocate more than 125 billion of US dollars of profits from around 100 of the world's largest and most profitable multinational enterprises to countries worldwide, ensuring that these firms pay a fair share of tax wherever they operate and generate profits. So maybe just a few words about those two pillars, what those two pillars are. So pillar one will ensure a fairer distribution of profits and taxing rights among countries with respect to the largest and most profitable enterprises. And it will reallocate some taxing rights over multinational enterprises from their home countries to the markets where they have business activities and, and uh, earn their profits, regardless of whether firms have a physical presence there or not. So specifically, multinational enterprises with global sales above 20 billion euro and profitability above 10% can be considered as the winners of the globalization will be covered by the new rules with 25% of their profit above the 10% threshold to be reallocated to market jurisdictions. And pillar two introduces a global minimum corporate tax rate set at 15%. And this new minimum tax rate will apply to companies with revenue above 750 million euro and is estimated to generate around 150 billion American dollars in additional global tax revenues. 
And uh, so these are the, the, the basic two pillars. I will not go into the details about how the European Union reacts to this, for example, because we will go to this a bit later, perhaps during our discussion, because we know that uh, some jurisdictions and also some geographical areas or economical areas like the European Union uh, were working on their own solutions. And those solutions were currently put on hold, waiting how this uh, global solution from OECD will take place. So first of all, I would like to ask our panelists today, how do you find this solution? Are you satisfied from different perspectives, perspective of the business, perspective of the government? Are you satisfied with uh, this two pillar approach and, and you think that this is something that uh, uh, we all, let's say all the stakeholders were waiting for? So whoever wants to start could be Petra, Agnieszka, Lukasz. Well, I can perhaps start. Um, I hope you hear me. My name is uh, Petra Wikström. I'm from Shipstead. Uh, and Shipstead is a Nordic media company, but we are also a big digital company uh, in the Nordic market where we operate classified marketplaces and financial services and different kind of comparison sites. Uh, but then we are also an anchor owner and actually the creator of a global company called Adevinta, which has classified marketplaces in 16 countries around the world world uh, and in Europe, for example, in France, Italy and Spain. So for us, the digital taxation issue has been extremely important for different reasons, and we have really been looking for a global solution. And one of the reasons for that is, of course, that we see that there is sort of an unlevel playing field. There is not a fair system of taxation around the globe, especially taking into account the biggest competitors that we as Shibstead have, which are the big, big tech companies on the digital market. So those are our competitors, both when it comes to the advertising business, when it comes to different kind of comparison sites, and of course, when it also comes to um, a lot of different issues around uh, distributing media. Um, but also when it comes to the national digital taxes that we have seen in some of the markets where especially Adevinta operates, uh, we have always called for a global solution, which is then harmonizing this system rather than having national solutions. So we are very supportive uh, of this uh, OECD solution, uh, but of course we still need to see how it will work in practice. Um, and especially we would say that this is a step in the right direction. Of course, we need to see how it will be implemented, what uh, are the practical solutions going to be, uh, but for us this is very good news. Okay, so maybe um, another uh, business perspective. Um, I'm uh, a tax advisor, so I uh, talk to um, different uh, groups, different um, enterprises, and uh, for sure uh, it will be a, a huge change. Uh, we have a, a completely new uh, idea uh, as regards the uh, generally transfer pricing rules within uh, Pillar 1. Of course, it will only concern the really the biggest uh, groups, uh, although there is, um, as I understand, the plan to decrease the threshold with uh, time, uh, but the change is, is really huge. And also the uh, solution addressed in Pillar 2, the, the minimum income tax, uh, it is something that much more uh, enterprises will uh, need to deal with. Um, so we, from my perspective, from, from my discussions with uh, clients, it's good. It's a good news that there is uh, any, you know, a progress that um, we know uh, a little bit more that, uh, that than we used to know because the discussions around the taxation uh, in digital economy uh, started many years ago and there were different ideas uh, within you uh, on the OECD level. Uh, so there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I have also some smaller groups, smaller uh, enterprises like uh, 
Polish um, um, groups uh, asking uh, whether this new solution will also concern them. Uh, so it's, it's good that we know a little bit more, but as Petra uh, said, uh, it's, it's very important to know more details, uh, to know how to prepare. Uh, 2023 is maybe not tomorrow, but uh, still it, the, the change seems to be, uh, seems to require uh, a lot of preparation, also from technical pr perspective. Mm, uh, so uh, we are waiting for uh, details of the solution, the drafts of MLI, and um, then we will know how to prepare. Thank you, Agnieszka. And hello everyone, my name is Łukasz Kuśmierz. Um, I'm on a daily basis coordinating Polish efforts with regard to Pillar 1 and 2 on the OECD forum. And uh, from the government perspective, the Polish government always said that uh, it is probably the best forum to address the challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy is the international forum and the best solution would appear right there. As to the latest statement and the latest achievement, it is a great unprecedented achievement in a way that it was very hard, very difficult to gather 100 and more, more than 130 jurisdictions under one banner to do the one exactly the same thing and coordinate all the efforts and have a consensus. In itself, from a political and diplomatical perspective, is a great success, unprecedented success, one at a time uh, in a generation chance and uh, I'm, I'm really proud that, that we did it, that jurisdiction had to uh, step up and, and did it. And now it all depends how we're going to implement it. And uh, it's completely, I will start it maybe, it's completely another discussion. So from a political perspective, it's a start, it's a great start. The public opinion says, okay, it's a success. And now all we have to do <laughs> is to implement it. But it's a completely different discussion and a uh, big challenge in itself. Yeah, thank you very much. So, yeah, let's then go a little bit to how to implement it, or maybe not how to implement it, but first of all, is it doable at all? Yeah, is it implementable as it is? Do you think that uh, those provisions, which are there, like, for example, this minimum 15% income tax, uh, this is something that all the countries, all the jurisdictions worldwide will accept? Because currently, there are still some jurisdictions and countries that are considered like tax paradises. So perhaps those multinational enterprises will have their seats there yeah, to uh, avoid taxation, taxations or maybe just to pay a little bit lower taxes. Uh, so do you think that you know, we can really count on this solidarity sort of still at this implementation phase and uh, all the countries worldwide would really be implementing this? Well, from, from our point of view, we have already seen that the pressure that has built up to this solution has already led to some changes. So we see that the US, of course, has had a big discussion about taxing, especially their big tech companies, and they have also started to tax them. Uh, but in particular, we have also seen that Ireland has now said that they will actually raise uh, their tax rate to 15%, which we heard in the summer that they were not well willing to do. So uh, I guess that the international pressure, uh, the political Political pressure is very important here. Um, and of course, I think there is also a lot of pressure in order to make sure that this will actually work. Uh, then the question is, of course, how will it work? Um, because of course, for us, uh, there are different kind of tax authorities that uh, need to sort of take into account the reporting requirements. Um, how will we know how much tax one company is paying to a certain uh, jurisdiction in order to then report to the other jurisdictions and so on? So uh, we really have a lot of questions about this, but from Shipset's point of view, and we are of course not one of those 100 companies, so we are not going to be part of this solution in that sense. Uh, but for us, the main possibility has really been to get a fairer tax system where we also see that the competitors we have in the digital market also pay tax and not only us that operate in the Nordic market or in the European market that have always paid tax. Okay, so basically, you know, the next question that uh, I would here have is uh, how this will, because you already Petra started this a little bit, yeah, that uh, this will not apply to you because you will not meet the uh, thresholds. However, there are other companies who are not necessarily such multinational 
corporations, but they operate just one or two, one, two or three markets because the digital economy basically provides those opportunities. And, and there are companies who are already meeting the threshold, yeah, or potentially meeting on Agnieszka already started mentioning something. And uh, they are a little bit afraid that they will be also subject to this taxation. Yeah? And uh, I remember that the, there were such uh, worries in the past years. So Agnieszka, is it is it something that those companies are still worried about? Or they, they basically, this solution you think will be fair enough and they shouldn't worry? Uh, well, if, uh, if we are talking um, about being covered by this tax, uh, I think that the smaller companies uh, should not be worrying um, in particular um, about the, the pillar one, because it's, it's really for the biggest. Uh, as regards pillar two, there is also quite, quite high uh, threshold. So um, the so MNEs, um, you know, they, they, will, uh, they will need to deal with this, uh, how it will in practice work for them, um, then we will know because we have some only some uh, general ideas. And here I, I would be um, curious, especially about the minimum tax, because you, you started for like this, um, uh, the, the, the question about this minimum um, tax, global, global minimum tax. And there are some um, carve outs um, expected, the substance carve outs, um, but we do not really uh, know uh, too much about that. Uh, and, um, you know, it depends if uh, there will be a, a real um, substance carve out. Um, I think the, that the real impact on uh, the companies conducting um, the, 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 uh, having operations in particular uh, countries with uh, even lower uh, CIT rates uh, should not be that um, that difficult. Uh, I'm curious how it will will work in Poland because we have like you know uh, some um, R and D some some tax reliefs and and uh, things like that that may decrease the effective. Uh, tax rate, uh, and um, I'm curious whether this um, substance carve out will help for, will be helpful for um, these companies uh, that benefit from the uh, reliefs, tax reliefs, which leads to the lower effective tax rate, and how it will work if it it will be, um, you know, easy to apply this, uh, this carve out uh, or not, uh, whether it will be assessed by the taxpayer uh, itself, because today we have in the tax law, we, we have uh, lots of um, uh, provisions in, in Polish tax law, and but, but also international, for example, in EU directives. So we have, uh, for example, in uh, parent subsidiary directive or, or other directives, the tax uh, consequences uh, depend on whether there is a business substance or no. Um, and it's quite, you know, difficult in practice sometimes to assess whether this substance will be accepted. It's the, you know, Polish, um, Polish practice uh, or not. And um, I'm, I'm thinking how it will work for this uh, pillar two uh, solution. Uh, will there be any, any kind of, you know, specific provision or, or maybe some, some guidelines on what you need to do to, to meet to, or, or to apply this, this carve out? So maybe it's a question to, to Lukasz. Yeah, it sounded like a question perhaps that uh, Lukas could answer. Of course, different jurisdictions or different countries may have a little bit different approach, yeah, but I'm sure that the, the Polish government uh, already looked into, into this and perhaps you maybe not the, read the policy for this, but perhaps you have some first thoughts about you know, how you think this, this should be approached. Uh, thank you. So, um... Yes, of course, and even more, the Poland was one of the biggest, uh, we, were, we were really on the on the front line with the substance care out, with um, also a few other countries that are heavily based on substance and investment incentives. 
just like Poland. We're talking here about an IP box, uh, R&D, um, R&D tax relief, uh, new coming robotization tax relief, and so on and so on, special economic zones. So the Poland was one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, biggest fan of the substance care note, and we push it really hard for it. And uh, it will ensure, and I can say that easily, it will ensure that um, uh, being constructed right now, the modern rules and the next the directive, European Union directive, and then the Polish law itself will ensure a high level of certainty with regard to the substance-based care note in a way that uh, it will describe very precisely what kind of assets are being calculated uh, will be calculated for the purpose of, of carve out, what the percentage will be, how the rules will be of the calculation, it all will be there. I don't know when exactly it will be there, but it will be there with a high degree of certainty to ensure that tax incentives can be still used if they were designed to attract a real investment. And pretty much this is the basics of uh, Polish tax incentives policy, that they are very heavily based on real economic substance. So uh, with regard to the pillar two, I think uh, it's going to be okay. <laughs> it's just a matter of how and when exactly it will be implemented. And what we already know is that there will be a directive planned for the pillar two, and it will be the first directive be before the, the pillar one. And it is coming really, really soon. It's a matter of weeks, not even months. So if, if I might just ask, is it going to be EU directive to, you know, uh, apply the pillar to solution within the EU countries? Yes, it was already publicly said by the Commission that it will be a pillar to directive, exactly. And as regards the, if, if I may ask, I, I don't know, the, as regards the, the carvas, you, you mentioned that there will be a list of assets and, the, you know, the values. Do you think that uh, it's possible to have also intangibles? Because from our perspective, in the digital economy, it's important to have also the, digit, the, the, the intangibles treated as assets. Because in, in uh, some previous uh, phases of, of ours on, on um, Pillar 2 and, and this global minimum tax, uh, only fixed assets assets were taken into account so for uh, for our industry the, the internet industry is not uh, not a good news uh, i would try to, to ask this uh, with regard to intangibles uh, the substance care will be limited only to only parts of fixed assets, not even of all fixed assets. And the basics for this is the statement itself from the 8th of October, right? So it was a part of very, very fearful, uh, harsh and difficult discussion and negotiations of what will be the, what will consist, uh, what the substance capital will consist of. That was a very difficult discussion. And uh, to be honest, it was one of the things that was most easily to agree that it should be based on fixed assets. What fixed assets is in our discussion, but there was an agreement a consensus pretty much pretty early that it should be based on fixed assets because intangibles are easily transferable. And because a project itself being called BEPS 2.0, so it's uh, aimed to fight with base erosion profit shifting. And intangibles are often maybe not always fairly, but often associated with a base erosion. So the agreement was to start with fixed assets. Then it was a very difficult discussion what fixed assets, but uh, it was a consensus from, I think, from very early stages that it should be based on real economic substance like building and uh, buildings, workers, employers, uh, property, and so on. Well, that's really interesting because we are talking about digital economy. Yeah, so this is like pretty normal that, you know, the markets that you generate your profits or your revenue and profits might be completely different from the ones that you are having your fixed assets, yeah, your buildings, your teams and so on. And, and this is normally the case, actually. Yeah. So I really wonder how we are going to handle all this and make it really fair. Uh, because if this is too complicated or if it becomes too complicated, I'm not afraid that this would make it easier for the multinational companies to really uh, avoid paying the taxes because, you know, it, it will be easier to navigate. You know, there is this saying that when the water is not clean, it, it basically 
easier for the fish to hide. Uh, so th th this could be the situation for the future. Uh, hopefully not, uh, because there is another thing that I wanted to discuss with you. It's basically the enforcement, because we are talking about the global solution. But of course, already I think Petra mentioned something about the, you know, the, a system of reporting, you know, and com good communication among all those countries involved and so on. So basically, you know, what are the currently available, as I understand none, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong, perhaps Lukasz knows better, some enforcement tools, and what should be the enforcement tools? Yeah, because uh, if the, many of the corporations, if they don't do the proper reporting, basically we will still not know where they are really generating the revenues and, and uh, their profits. Yeah. I think from again from a business perspective, I mean, of course, um, it's very important to have um, transparency and predictability in this issue. And also what we have always been calling for is to avoid double taxation. Um, and of course, this is imp important to when we are discussing, you know, new rules in, in digital tax and also the, to the question of what is actually going to be taxed. Are we taxing advertising income online or are we taxing transactions? What are we actually taxing? Uh, but what we have, for example, seen in these national solutions that we have in uh, certain European countries is that there has not been a possibility to deduct. So there will be kind of a double taxation for companies that are already taxing, you know, paying profit uh, tax in their own uh, countries, and then they will have to pay a digital tax on top of that. So again, I think this is important when we are looking at enforcement and also the reporting to understand for a company what is actually going to be taxed and how is that going to be calculated based on what is already being paid. Uh, but of course, this is not going to affect us in the in the sort of first instance. But we are already, as Adevinta, the company that we are a big shareholder of, is already paying national digital tax uh, in four or five countries in Europe. Uh, and there, the, the question of double taxation has been a very important one. So uh, transparency and, of course, predictability would be very important. Yeah, th thank you very much, Petra. But th that's true that this double taxation is it's, that was one of the worries of the companies in the last several years, especially the smaller companies that we're discussing this with, but also the multinationals, uh, the multinational corporations, they were also afraid that in the end, the solution may be so strict that they will start paying double in some instances. I can see that Agnieszka already unmuted herself, so perhaps you wanted to comment on this as well. Yeah, so I um, agree with uh, Petra that there is this um, this issue of, of digital uh, services taxes, which uh, are, are, as I understand, to be uh, cancelled uh, when the uh, tubular solution is to be implemented. But uh, I think that the reason why the, um, the countries within you or other countries decided to uh, implement digital services taxes is just one of the reasons is uh, just because it's easier uh, to enforce yeah it's 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 not that difficult uh, mechanism uh, just a percentage of, of the turnover uh, and as regards uh, for example pillar one solution it's much more complicated and uh, i understand the concerns uh, that uh, patron mentioned about how to calculate it and how to comply with because when we are uh, discussing the uh, enforceability, there are two aspects. Uh, first, how to make the companies really pay, how to uh, make them not to avoid and not to be able to avoid. But the second uh, aspect, more business, uh, from, from business perspective, is uh, whether there will be the certainty how to calculate and where to pay. And, you know, um, the, as for, for now, we don't know about the too much so uh, for this new solution from from my perspective for this new solution to be uh, really effective um, uh, it needs to be uh, clear uh, and when it is clear it's uh, from uh, on, on one hand it's more, more difficult to avoid and on the second hand it's uh, you know for those uh, who really want to comply um, it's also uh, easier Because do you have any, any opinion on all this, like you know, from the Polish government perspective, or are you looking at this, you know, how to enforce this solution? 
And I mean, it's it's a very, very interesting question in a way that we are far away from enforcing because uh, the statement from 8th October is just the beginning, to be honest, of real technical work. Now we have to go to the working parties, which is already happening uh, in the OECD and start working on a convention, which will take a few months. And the convention is a deal between each jurisdiction. That means it will have to translate this convention after very fast ratification process, and we have to transfer this convention into uh, each jurisdiction legislations. So it has to be done in a very ambitious timeline. And uh, from this beginning, from the statement that only says uh, a few words on, on certain topics, we have to go through a tough negotiation process through entire convention. It will be a lot of pages long. Then we have to translate this again into the uh, legislation of each country. And each country will approach the same legislation differently. So uh, it's really hard to say right now what will be the final effect. The harmonization and the idea of harmonization of pillar one is the harmonization of the general purpose and general idea how it should work. But for example, feeling at how the forms would, will look like, it may differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So it, it's, it's really, in my opinion, it's too early to say, uh, to say how this will work exactly. But this is one of the biggest challenges, to be honest, of Pillar 1 entirely. How do we implement it? Uh, how do we build a capacity for tax administration? Because this is a problem that requires to build a lot of capacity in, in administration itself. We have to hire new tax specialists, uh, school them, uh, make them uh, to work with biggest companies in a new special departments. It it's requires a lot of work on the side of tax administration itself. And the second thing, or I should say the first thing, is to simply implement it in such an ambitious timeline, because timeline is very ambitious, and all jurisdictions are already uh, already uh, doing what they can to implement it, and uh, already the working party on the OECD have started to work on the, on the convention, but there's a long way ahead of us, and it's simply in my opinion, too early to say about enforcement tools or certain mechanisms that are going to be implemented in, its, uh, in, in the solution, the final solution, the technical one in the legislation. Well, if I may add something, maybe, and, 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 and the question, uh, we, we have some already some uh, experience with a multilateral uh, convention, yeah, because we have MLI for uh, BEPS uh, project from, for, for other uh, actions. And uh, after uh, like four or five years, we have about 90 or more than 90 countries uh that enforced this but it took them years uh, when you, you you can you can find a list of countries and uh, the year in which they um implemented uh, so it normally took them like two or three years so i'm i'm wondering whether it's uh, really possible uh to have uh, this new tool this uh, new mli uh, enforced uh, in all the countries um, that uh, signed the agreement um, in July, like in 2023, because uh, every country has its own ratification process and it takes time and we know, and maybe, you, you, you know, some, some countries may be less um, willing to, to implement it uh, very fast. Uh, so probably the question about the enforceability and, and implementation is, is, is right because we, we, we don't know it may uh, take like a few years uh, as it is it was with the, 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 the previous uh, MLI. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. But, you know, the, the overall picture after this, which I can see is that on one hand, you are all very happy and very enthusiastic about the general idea and the solution and the fact that the OECD finally has come to this to this uh, conclusion, this solution. So yeah, fantastic, yeah. But to, when we go more into the details and we start discussing how this should be implemented and uh, where and, and so on and what kind of different challenges it also creates, including even the very ambitious timeline, timeline it looks like uh, the, the, all the potential challenges are ahead of us. Yeah, so far we are happy, but we are on a very like high level. 
solution at the moment. And now when we are going more into the details and basically more into or closer to the implementation phase, it appears that it may not be so simple at all. Yeah, it may be quite complex and complicated. It may take even longer than we really uh, anticipated. So maybe from this picture, if I may ask you, what would you advise people who are working on this on a like more global scale, whose idea was to harmonize it? So I would say to uh, legislators from the OECD, but even you know from zones like the European Union, for example, what what could be our advice from let's say local governments, local businesses? You know what they should do, what they shouldn't do. Maybe you know we should be thinking about longer timeline, yeah, not this up to two years, but uh, maybe we should be more realistic and say no, it will take longer. So maybe let's you know admit this that we are not we are not we will be not able to have it like you know fully harmonized globally in two years and so on. So so do you have any kind of you know that 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 sort of I don't know, thoughts or ideas or recommendations? Well, um, I'm not the right person to answer how that should work in practice, uh, but I, I, of course, hope very much that, uh, you know, the different countries will sit together and, and look how they will sort of implement this. Uh, what we see is that, you know, we are really quite much further than where we were some time ago or a year ago, uh, having countries that want to implement this. Now we had a lot of countries saying that they want to do, don't want to do it and now they have still agreed. Uh, and also that we have uh, countries that have their national DSTs, the digital services taxes saying that they will cancel them uh, when this uh, system is in place, which is also extremely important. So I think, you know, the, the, just the signal effect of this has already had uh, an impact, I think, on the businesses uh, in order to sort of re be reassured that uh, we won't have national solutions in the, in the future, because these national solutions are really quite damaging. Um, and I think, you know, there's been a lot of uh, time and effort built into the national solutions as well. So <laughs> one would, of course, hope that one would uh, put more than time and effort to look at how we can work together uh, in the OECD framework. Uh, and, um, you know, and also just the fact of having harmonization so that it's the same system everywhere rather than different systems in different uh, countries, um, which is very, very harmful for, for business, uh, global business, or even uh, just European level business. So what do you think when those country solutions uh, should be cancelled? I mean, because, you know, the, the, the danger I can see here is that uh, there will be still double taxation, because if the countries say that, yes, we will cancel our country solution, but only providing that uh, this full harmonization is fully implemented worldwide, yeah, then this means that for some time, at least, there will be some kind of overlap yeah, and double taxation. So it shouldn't be like, you know, one of the first steps for the countries with, with local solutions that they should just cancel it, uh, even if it is not fully harmonized or fully implemented in other countries. But perhaps just at this point, I think it's extremely important to see what the European Union will do. So as already mentioned, they have uh, already said, uh, the Commissioner Gentiloni has said that already, I think before Christmas, they would uh, come with a proposal on how to, to see how, to, how we can harmonize the implementation. Uh, and we would also want, of course, to have a very strong signal from the Commission saying that, you know, now it's time to cancel the national solutions because we are sort of going, uh, moving forward towards uh, a global OECD solution so that the country, countries actually, you know, also will do it. Uh, and perhaps that could also be discussed on an EU level. So we think that, you know, the, the more we can do on an EU level as well to sort of prepare for the global solution and the signals that we get from the Commission saying that national solutions should be cancelled would already be very important. Okay, thank you very much. Because I know that the Polish government was from the very beginning rather against local solutions. Yeah? However, at the same time, ready because there was time that the, the Polish government used to work on local solutions as well, but only providing that there, will, there would be no global solution. Yeah? So currently, basically, I understand that uh, you are still against those local solutions and you would probably support this push for you know, global and, and at least pan-European solution still. Uh, but even from from your perspective, you know, when the, you look at yourself as the you know the local government who has to implement it now, 
what would be your wish, let's say, to the European Commission or to OECD, you know, to make your life perhaps easier, you know, how you would see this, bearing in mind all those potential challenges coming up? Um, right now, there's, um, to be honest, I will start with that. There's a very interesting discussion internally between jurisdictions uh, in the EU. Whether this is an appropriate way to uh, implement the Pillar 1 with uh, some kind of a directive. And, uh, because the Pillar 1 in itself must be based on a multilateral convention. It simply it will not work if there will be no convention. So many people, uh, in professors, uh, there is a lot of discussion are wondering if this is really necessary to harmonize it on the European level, because paradoxically, it may not help. This is an open discussion. I don't have a, an answer right now, but uh, the crucial crucial thing here is the definition of not only unilateral measures, so the, the jurisdictional DCs, but also a definition of critical mass, because the pillar one will only go into force when there will be a critical mass reached. And this critical mass, which will be defined in the multilateral convention, has not been discussed or defined yet. So uh, what uh, is happening right now is the jurisdiction between themselves are discussing how to define it. And when we will know what the critical mass means, then we will have a starting point for further discussion on the implementation. Because, for example, we could have an uh, entire European Union joining the agreement, joining the convention, and some other jurisdictions from other regions of the world will be maybe not reluctant, but uh, would, won't be uh, so um, happy to implement it uh, in a really fast manner. So the critical mass won't be reached. That's why it's very important to start slow with the convention itself. Then we will see what will happen next. Because right now, starting and assuming that we will need a directive or the executive act from the commission or something like this, it's simply, again, I will say that, maybe too early in a way that certain definitions have not been stated right now and we are still working on some uh, very important they are details but they are very important uh, details as to the unilateral measures themselves the statement somehow says something about the um, uh, how to revoke and when to revoke those digital service taxes in a way that the jurisdictions already um, are obliged not to introduce new taxes, and that's in the statement in itself, literally, so it's a uh, helpful information. And the second thing is that the existing digital service taxes will be uh, removed, will be revoked when the Pillar 1 will be in place. And already there has been some movement in this area, as the uh, jurisdictions that already have such taxes have... Uh, contacted, communicated with the United States and make uh, certain statements how it will be calculated when those digital service taxes will be revoked. So it gives a certain level of certainty what will happen next. And it's all constructed in a way that if, for example, the Pillar 1 will not work, we hope it will work, uh, but if it will not work, then the digital service taxes and the unilateral measures will remain. This is how it's all constructed. So Pillar 1 is coming to force, the digital service taxes are off. But if not, the situation will look completely uh, different. Okay, thank you very much, Vukash. That, that explains a lot as well. Uh, we have still 15 minutes to go. However, the idea was that the last quarter would be more for questions from the audience, but unfortunately, I can't see any questions from the audience so far, at least. Uh, so maybe then we can either finish a little bit earlier or take some questions. I can see some people, I think, raising hands, but I don't, I'm not sure in the public, I'm not sure how is it possible that they ask us because we can only read those questions online or no, there is a mic, okay. So let's listen to the question. I hope it works. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, so I'm Mohammed, and I'm coming from Iran and uh, I have a very uh, personal question. When we talk about taxation, uh, we are now in an era of decentralized finance and game finance. And uh, you know, there are a lot of like economic instruments in the entertainment sector 
that are called like play and earn and a lot of like similar issues. With the advancement of blockchain technologies that basically is against the economic institutions, how should we address in future the, the, the implementation of a taxation regime? Because uh, personally, uh, I'm an ad advisor to Iranian regulatory body, and this is kind of one of the uh, the most challenging situation that we have. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, from the uh, the panelists regarding this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this question. It's, it's very interesting indeed. It touches upon a different area that we are discussing here today, but uh, you are right that uh, th this is the future. Yeah, so this is probably one of the next steps. So is anyone of, from our experts uh, feels like answering these questions? Petra, Agnieszka, Łukasz, any kind of thoughts about this? Let me maybe try. Let me try. I will try. I'm not saying that the question will be satisfactory, the answer will be satisfactory, but I will try. Uh, as we're talking about the statement and the recent discussions, the statement directly says that the regulated financial services are excluded, which is very interesting in a way that it resembles the general discussion about the modern finance that is the, that's happening right now. So the regulated classic services like banks. Uh, are excluded from this new reform. But unregulated services, for example, uh, innovative uh, fintechs, uh, this kind of uh, blockchain-based uh, financial institutions and on and on, they are not excluded. That means they are not excluded only because they are not regulated. So if we are look at the landscape of regulation that is coming, for example, in the European Union, which is right now preparing certain regulations to regulate blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, especially even cryptocurrencies at all. So uh, when they will become regulated, they will treat it equally as the classic finance, and that will change their, how we perceive them and their position in the tax world in general. So right now they are not excluded, but they will be excluded when they will be regulated. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yes, I have one. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm an AI student and uh, it touches my topic and there is a growing debate about the data collection and processing tax. Should it uh, be introduced and if yes, how it should be introduced for the companies? Again, the same question to our expert panelists. Who feels like answering this question? The like data I, collection processing tax. Yeah, it's very it's very interesting question, and we have been uh, thinking about it a bit in in ships that as we are a very data driven company, um, so we don't have a position on it yet. Uh, but of course, I mean, we have to again. I think we'll probably come back to sort of this issue of double taxation. Uh, we are very willing to pay our taxes, to pay our fair share to the society. Uh, but if we are going to introduce new taxes, we have to see, you know, what the impact will be on the taxes we already pay. Um, so that is probably the, the answer I could give at, at the moment. But I would agree that we probably need to look at new ways of taxing, also to the sort of question we had earlier when uh, the whole um, sort of uh, market and the digital environment is developing so rapidly. Uh, and also, you know, um, the COVID has, of course, brought a situation where we may have employees in different countries than what we used to have. I mean, we are, we are not sort of uh, so geographically uh, restricted as we have perhaps been before. So I think that there is definitely a merit in discussing these things. But as I said, for us, the main issue is always to see that we don't pay, you know, an additional amount of tax, with, as we already think we pay, you know, the fair share. So it's avoiding double taxation would be the most important thing. Thank, Thank you very much. Petra. Does this answer the question? I hope yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Are there some more questions? Uh, 
I guess not, because I don't see anyone moving. And also, I don't see any questions here online in the chat function. OK, so maybe we have still 10 minutes left. left. Uh, so any of our experts and the panelists, because before we say, say thank you to everyone, do you have some maybe closing statements or something that we didn't discuss, we didn't ask about something that you consider important and should be mentioned during our today's discussions? I think I would probably just want to mention briefly the European uh, digital levy that, of course, you already mentioned at the beginning that this has now been said to be put on hold. Uh, but we, of course, as a digital company, are very interested in, in seeing what that would mean. And uh, what we feel is an interesting notion from the Commission saying that because digital companies, so to say, have gained from the COVID pandemic crisis, digital companies would need to pay a new levy to the Commission to also pay for the recovery of the crisis. Um, and this is something we find quite worrying, that we are starting to look at um, sort of taxing certain sectors because they may or may not be gaining from some situation in the in the sort of society. Uh, we don't really see a, a similar issues anywhere else. And we also think that in the future, of course, we're now looking at the digital uh, tax in particular, um, but why would companies be tax differently based on their digital or not digital incomes. Uh, so we think that it's very good that the Commission has put this on hold, um, but at the same time we would also just question the rationale about behind uh, you know, taxing digital companies because of their impact or not on the COVID pandemic. Thank you very much, Petra. I, I can really rely you know, to this because we had similar situations when the pandemic started in Poland when the Polish government implemented so-called VOD tax. So basically, it is not a tax yet, but this is a special fund created, and this fund basically is being obligatory funded by VOD services. And it was the the main discussion was exactly that you know the companies and the sort of businesses that uh, benefited from the pandemic because their revenues basically started growing. Uh, they should. Uh, help uh, in the content or movie production, you know, and, and supporting other industries who were offline like cinemas. Uh, so this is this is something that is also very worrying and, and basically very uh, disturbing direction, I would say, and very dangerous direction, which uh, already is happening from time to time on the national level, but even more worrying when it happens on the level like European Union. Agnieszka, I, I, sorry, I think I did, in, interrupted you because I saw that yes. you were unmuting yourself. Yes, uh, thank you. I uh, just wanted to add because you, you mentioned, um, you know, um, that, that the reasons, that the business reasons that um, uh, justify that the, the tax on the EU level should not be um, implemented. And f for me, it's uh, the, the EU digital uh, levy uh, that was discussed uh, earlier this year, it was something quite, um, it could be something quite uh, similar to uh, DST. So uh, it could be some, you know, it's, it's inconsistent. It would be inconsistent with the OECD idea and work. So I, I also feel that uh, it's a good movement that the works are not uh, continued uh, on this. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. And at the end, I want to say that uh, I forgot to put a one again. There was a great momentum and a great atmosphere. Uh, it's really uh, different. It's completely different than from the first MLI. There was a great atmosphere. The jurisdictions are willing to implement. So I think we can have high hopes for this ambitious timeline. I don't know if it will, uh, if it will happen, if we will be able to uphold the timeline. But uh, there was a great atmosphere. It's a great momentum. It's a great willingness which is something new in international taxation, that there's a great willingness in all jurisdictions to do that. So uh, let's have high hopes that it will work in this ambitious timeline. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we are all crossing our fingers that this will finally happen. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, our panelists, uh, Łukasz Kuśmierz from the Ministry of Finance, Republic of Poland, Petra Wikström from Shipstead, 
and Agnieszka Wnut from MDDP Group. Thank you to all the participants online, offline, and also to, to our very good to questions because those questions are so interesting that I think we could at least try to include them in the future panel discussions, or maybe even think if this could be a standalone topic for IGF 2022, perhaps, because uh, they are really so, so interesting, especially the one about unregulated finance economy and uh, blockchain-based cryptocurrencies, uh, trading, and so on, because this is really topic, and, and all this online gaming and esports and so on, this is topic which is uh, on its own huge and, and probably requires an additional and completely independent discussion. So thank you very much once again uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the IGF today and during the whole week and hope to see you soon again. Thank you very much and goodbye.